Hey, everybody. Welcome. Uh, thanks for joining us tonight. Um, we're very excited uh, to have this special session uh, led by Hugo Picard uh, from Fermentis. Um, really time to, to focus on uh, active dry yeast and kind of debunking some of the myths. So uh, thank you again, Hugo. Uh, we're, we're thrilled to have you and uh, look forward to your presentation. No problem. Thank you to the to the club to to host us. Uh, so tonight uh, I'm here with uh, my colleague uh, Jose Pizzaro, uh, who is in Hi charge guys. of uh, the craft segment uh, for the East area uh, in North America, uh, US and Canada. Uh, so we are here together for around uh, 45 minutes of presentation. And after uh, around uh, 30 minutes of uh, Q&A, um, Brandon, do you know if everybody is there, more or less? Uh, we are now 14 on 29 registered. Yeah, I think I think uh, we'll have some more folks join um, as people uh, get get back from work and dinner. But okay. uh, but but thank you, uh, thank you to you both. Okay, so you, um, it's it's good. Uh, it's good for you to start, and uh, the rest of the team will just jump in after that. Yes, thank you. Perfect. So I will just uh, deactivate your your device for the presentation, and I will reactivate your your microphone at the end for the Q and A, Brendan, if it's okay for you. Absolutely. Thank you. Perfect. See you in forty five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, guys, so as I said, uh, we are here tonight uh, for uh, 45 minutes to, to speak about uh, yeast and try to demystify a bit this uh, raw material uh, you, you all know. Uh, first, uh, as I said, uh, a special thank to to all of you and uh, especially Brendan because I, I have been in touch with him but uh, I suppose it's all the team behind that so thank you for giving us this opportunity to to speak tonight and to see so much interest about our uh, product what is uh, the engine there for for tonight uh, it's uh, three parts, uh, mainly. Uh, the first about uh, our production and, and dry process, so with a, a manufacturing process overview, uh, the step of a focus on the step of propagation and drying, and uh, our quality procedures. A second part about uh, chef life study, with a forced aging test, natural aging test, and the conclusions. And a third part uh, about um, a study about radiation viability and vitality, and a focus on uh, our what we call easy to use concept. So let's start. And as uh, Jose just said in, in the chat, he's here to to moderate the chat. So don't hesitate to simply tap your tap your question and uh, we will uh, answer at the end, or Jose will uh, directly answer in, in the chat. Uh, so first, uh, let's start with uh, the beginning, uh, how we uh, produce uh, active dry yeast. What you can see there, it's uh, the scheme of how uh, we produce active dry yeast. Um, Everything starts with a uh, cryotube stored at minus 80 degrees uh, C. So it's around uh, minus uh, 112 degrees Fahrenheit. You will see many times that I have to convert degrees Celsius in, in Fahrenheit tonight. So in advance, uh, sorry about that. Uh, this cryotube are coming from our R&D department and are sent to our facility production in Belgium. It's a, a factory called Algist. And in this factory, you have a first step, a first step of multiplication in uh, a laboratory. Uh, you, we start with a, a flask of uh, 250 milliliters uh, to a higher flask of uh, three liters. So here we are still in laboratory. After that, uh, we have uh, the multiplication step. 
it's at this stage that uh, we want uh, to create uh, biomass. We start uh, from uh, this kind of tank and we go to bigger and bigger tank. Uh, to produce biomass, uh, what we need, we need uh, sugar, of course, oxygen, uh, uh, nutrients, uh, vitamins, and uh, trace elements. And if we look deeply what happened right there, it's basically that. Uh, what we want to do at this stage is uh, simply propagate uh, the yeast and we want to duplicate yeast cells uh, again and again in the, in the fermenter. So we want to repeat uh, a lot this cycle. Uh, everything starts uh, here with the, repli the replication of the DNA material. Uh, the migration of the DNA uh, to the two extremity of of the cells, and finally uh, the division of the mother cell in two uh, identical uh, uh, daughter cell. Um, once we have a maximum of uh, daughter cells, we stop uh, the division. Uh, to let uh, yeast cell at a stage where uh, we say doors are open for uh, sugar assimilation. What it means is that when uh, yeast cells are not budding anymore, uh, they are able uh, to uh, assimilate all kinds of sugar you could have in your world, like maltose, glucose, etc. It's the reason why we say that dry yeast uh, is in fact one of the freshest uh, yeast format you could find because as soon as you will put it in your wort, uh, it will start to ferment uh, immediately. So it's what uh, happened in, oh, sorry, in this big fermenter. After that, uh, we have a step of uh, separation. Uh, so in a, cent in a centrifugator, uh, from one side you will have uh, wastewater uh, that will be sent to a treatment plant. And on the other side, uh, you will have a kind of cream, uh, a yeast cream, that we will store at uh, 4 degrees uh, Celsius. This cream uh, will be sent on a vacuum filter to obtain a kind of uh, pasta. And this pasta will be, will be sent uh, to, on a fluidized air bed. Uh, in fact, it's, it's a system to dry yeast uh, without air. It's what you can see there. Uh, and if we look deeply, what happened when we when we dry the yeast? Uh, before dry yeast, uh, before drying, uh, you have yeast cells that you that look like uh, this with a small cell surface, and you have between 25 to 30 uh, percent of dry matter. After drying, uh, you have an uneven cell, surf uh, cell surface and uh, a percent of dry matter uh, between 94 and 96.5 percent. So it's basically how we produce uh, active dry yeast here at Fermentis. Uh, but what is also very important for, for us and, and for you at the end, it's uh, the quality of our products. We, we only want to, to deliver the best product as possible. It's the, reason, it's the reason why we have a lot uh, of quality control all along our production system. What you see there, it's what happened uh, before uh, the yeast arrived in uh, our factory in Belgium. Uh, first, uh, when we, we found uh, a new interesting yeast strain, uh, we control uh, for the first time uh, genetic purity and uh, properties of, the st uh, of these strains. If uh, if all is good, we can add it to what we call our LUSAF yeast uh, collation, R&D, meaning that the strain will be uh, studied more in details uh, by our search, uh, searchers uh, to find interesting properties uh, for fermented beverages, or it could be for uh, animal nutrition, baking, many things. Uh, after this, uh, once this uh, yeast in the in the collection, and if we find one of them interesting, we want to uh, pass it to our industrial collection. 
so for production in facilities. And again, we'll do a second uh, quality control based uh, on the same characteristics as the first one. Um, once uh, we, we succeed to produce, uh, we find a good way to produce this yeast strain in big quantity, uh, we have to, to put this, uh, this yeast strain in cryotube. I just presented you before, it's what we call here daughter line yeast tubes. And again, to go uh, to pass from uh, the industrial collection to uh, daughter line yeast tubes, we have a third uh, quality control. After that, uh, this tube, as I said before, are sent to the factory in Belgium. And between these two steps, you have uh, a quality control number four. It's not exactly the same. It's just based on genetic and uh, properties. So after that, you arrived uh, in our facility in Belgium and you find again all uh, the steps I just presented you before. So the daughter line yeast tubes, cryotubes, the laboratory phase, uh, labor the labor laboratory phase, sorry, industrial phase uh, with biomass production and drying uh, and the storage. And between the laboratory and industrial phase, uh, you have uh, again, a quality control uh, based on purity. And the most important one uh, arrived at the end of the production. Uh, we only release a product for sale if uh, the last quality control is good. And this quality control is based on purity, composition, aging, and property studies. If everything is good, it's only there that we say we can uh, sell the product uh, all around the world. Uh, so at the end, you have uh, seven quality controls uh, before to have uh, a yeast strain on the market. It's very important for us. So now you know how we basically how how we produce active dry yeast and uh, the quality, how we control uh, the quality of our product. Let's see for how long you can store this uh, product at home. And we will see that with uh, a chef life study we have conducted here internally at Fermentis. Uh, first, with what we call a, a forced aging test. Uh, to study the, the chef life of our product takes time. Uh, it, uh, it's, we count that in years. Uh, but we can simulate this natural aging by putting uh, the yeast in a specific temperature for a specific amount of time. So uh, by doing that, we have simulated uh, four different uh, type of aging, aging of one year, two years, three years, and four years. And uh, we have compared uh, the result of fermentation between the fresh, uh, fresh active dry yeast and age active dry yeast. So we have compared fermentative powers, the viability, and the end of fermentation compounds like residual sugar and other volatile compounds. Let's have a look to, to this result. Um, um, so on the following slide, uh, you will always see uh, the most extreme condition, meaning you will not, I will not spot you uh, the two years or three years of forced uh, aging, but only uh, the results for four years of forced aging compared with the fresh active dry yeast. It will be easier to read. Um, so if we have a look on uh, of the impact on uh, fermentation performance, uh, so you have fermentation time on the left and uh, fermentation rate on the right. And you have different uh, yeast strains of our portfolio, SO4, USO5, you all know, but also many others. Uh, what you can see there is that between uh, fresh and uh, forced age active dry yeast, we don't have uh, significant uh, differences between uh, between the two. You have the same time of fermentation and the same uh, fermentation weight, and it's the same for all our strains. So basically, you don't have any impact uh, of the aging on ales uh, strains. 
if we have a look uh, of the impact on uh, the aging on volatile compounds and ethanol production, uh, first, uh, I just want that you pay attention to the scale. Uh, it's not starting to from zero, just to zoom on uh, the final results and the same here. And sorry for this scale here, you don't have the 0.5, but it's well, 5.5, 6, 6.5, etc. So first, uh, the, what you can see there is the ester produce. It's, uh, it's explained in uh, PPM. Uh, PPM means part per million. If you don't know, it's a unit used in, in chemistry to express a mass fraction. So basically, it's a quantity. Uh, you have the same amount of ester produced between uh, fresh and uh, aged active dry yeast. So no difference. If we have a look at the ethanol produce, uh, the same conclusion. Uh, it's, uh, we don't have significant uh, differences between fresh and aged active dry yeast. Um, for the higher alcohol uh, produce, it's uh, basically the same again. We don't have significant uh, differences. Um, if we now have a look to, to the lager strains, uh, so S23, uh, W3470, sorry, the S is wrong here, and S1089. Uh, um, we can do the same conclusion. If you look at all the graph, uh, we always have the same results between uh, fresh and uh, age active dry yeasts. I will not go in details every time but you see clearly that you don't have any significant impact of aging. So you can say um, we have proved that we don't have any uh, significant differences, but it was with a forced aging test, uh, so not really natural. Uh, and we wanted to know if it changed if we store uh, the yeast in the true condition of, of the real world. Uh, so it's what we, we have done with this natural aging test. Uh, we have stored the yeast during 44 months at uh, minus 25 and uh, 25 degrees C. Uh, the equivalent in Fahrenheit will be there in the, in the next, next slide, sorry. And again, uh, we will compare at the end the fermentative powers, the viability, and uh, the end of fermentation compounds. Uh, they are the, the equivalent as there in Fahrenheit. Um, so first, have a look to, to the L strain. Uh, I didn't put all our L strain, but just for you to know that the results were consistent uh, for all our L strains. Uh, here is the example of uh, SAF ale SO4, and what you can see there is the kinetic of fermentation in uh, in Plato. Uh, so the fresh yeast is in yellow, and you have uh, three types of red uh, for the aged yeast at different temperature. And what we can see is that uh, the kinetic is always the same if you have a fresh yeast or a yeast stored at minus 25 or 25 degrees C. So uh, the aging uh, doesn't have any impact on uh, the, the fermentation performance of L strain because as I, as I said, uh, the results were consistent for all our L strains. If we now have a look uh, to the fermentation performance of our lager strains, again, I just put there uh, one example, it's W3470. Uh, and here we have changed the scale, we don't speak in uh, degree plateau anymore, but in apparent degree of uh, fermentation. And here, contrary to, to the L strain, we clearly see uh, a difference between the fresh batch and uh, the age uh, active dry yeast, especially uh, with uh, active dry yeast uh, stored at uh, 77 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, first, uh, the kinetic is not the same. Uh, we see that uh, the fresh active dry yeast 
go uh, faster uh, than the others at, at the beginning. And at the end, we don't have exactly the same apparent degree of fermentation uh, between the, fair, the fresh active dry yeast. Uh, in the case of, uh, at, of W3470, uh, we are here at 80%. And after four years uh, stored at uh, 77 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, we are here at around 76%. Uh, so it's not a big difference, but it's, signif it's significant. But just keep in mind that we are in extreme conditions, so stored at 77 degrees Fahrenheit and after four years. So it's, it's very extreme. And I, we suppose that it doesn't happen uh, too much time in, in, in reality, but we have differences contrary to age strain. So what we can conclude of this study is that we don't have significant differences between fresh and aged uh, yeast uh, for three years. Why we say uh, three years? It's because the slide I just showed you before, we know that for L strain, we don't have any problem with four years uh, age active dry yeast, but we have uh, a significant different uh, difference for uh, lager strain. And uh, we, de we did the choice to be as clear as possible and put uh, a shelf life of three years for all our products. It's clearer for everyone. And uh, keep in mind to store uh, the fermented yeast in cool and dry condition. Uh, it's recommended for large periods, but don't worry, uh, for example, if you, you order your, your yeast on internet, uh, if it takes uh, one to three days uh, to come during summer, it will not uh, affect the, the yeast quality. So now that uh, you know how to, you have ordered your active dry yeast, you know how it's produced, you know how to store it. Uh, let's use it. It's your brewing day and uh, you, you will have to use your active dry yeast. How to do it? Rehydration or direct pitch? And it's what we will uh, see there. Uh, so just a reminder, we will study uh, the rehydration viability uh, the impact of the radiation parameters on viability and vitality. Uh, so viability is simply the fact that a yeast cell is dead or alive, uh, no more than that. And vitality, it's uh, the energy uh, the yeast will have to work. So as I said, when you want, when you want to use active dry yeast, uh, you find on the forums, on the internet, on many websites, two options. Uh, many people will say that you have to rehydrate. Uh, so the basic procedure is simply add the yeast to 10 times its weight of water or wort, leave to rest uh, during 15 minutes, steer gently and pitch into the fermenter. It's the first method. And the other one, it's uh, direct pitch. So it's a, a scheme for craft brewers, uh, but Basically, it just sprinkles the yeast uh, on wall surface, and that's all. So it's the easiest method. So which one is the best? Uh, to, to explore that, we'll first see how does uh, rehydration impact uh, yeast cell uh, viability. And uh, to answer this question, we have put in place this protocol. Uh, so. The idea is to measure uh, the, vi the viability uh, of yeast after a different type of uh, rehydration. Each time we will rehydrate dry yeast in ta 10 times its weight uh, of various media, but we will play with uh, different parameters. First, with the time, in time of rehydration, uh, we'll do rehydration of uh, 44, 45 minutes in total, but we'll but with measurements taken at uh, 15, 25, 35, and uh, 45 minutes of radiation. Uh, we'll play with the agitation. Uh, so we will try without uh, radiation, without agitation. The yeast plays on liquid surface and radiation is completed without agitation at all. 
Uh, moderate agitation, uh, the yeast just play some liquid surface, no agitation for 15 minutes, and agitated uh, at the end at 100 rotation per minute. And third, a violent agitation, the yeast is placed in a sterile flask, the medium is poured on the yeast, and the violent agitation is applied every two or three minutes. Uh, the third parameter we will play with is temperature. Uh, we, we will do trials at uh, 46, 54, 61, 68, 90, and 104 uh, degree Fahrenheit. And fi finally, we will play uh, with the media of radiation. Uh, first, uh, three types of water, uh, distilled mineral and tap water, and uh, three types of wort, um, 7, 15, and uh, 25 degree uh, plateau. And uh, to measure this uh, viability, we will do what we call a trip and blue exclusion test. Uh, trip and blue is simply pr a product uh, that has the capacity to uh, color in blue uh, damaged cell. So it's quite easy for us with a microscope to simply count dead cells because they will be uh, colored in blue. And finally, have the percent of viability. Um, so let's have a look to, to these results. So here we are speaking about uh, L strains. Uh, you have three uh, examples, uh, T58, USO5, and F33. And uh, what we can say directly is that uh, some strains are more sensitive than others to different parameters, and we have uh, we have tried to, to expose you here uh, three types of, of strains, really. USO5 is one node for to be a sensitive strain. S33 is, is in the average, if you can say that. And T58 is really a, a robust strain. Uh, pay attention to the color code. Uh, in blue, it's without hesitation. In red, in, uh, it's moderate agitation, and in green, it's uh, violent agitation. For uh, the three strains, uh, what we can say is that clearly, uh, more uh, you agitate, so violent agitation, uh, more you, you reduce the percent of uh, cell viability. You can clearly see the gap each time. It's true for uh, the, the three strains. Uh, and sorry, I didn't say it, but uh, pay attention again to the scale. Uh, again, we start at 50% just to focus on uh, the end results. And what we can also notice, notice is that a higher temperature seems uh, to be uh, the, more, uh, the most interesting condition. Um, but it's quite logical because we are speaking about ale strain. Uh, so it's logic to that it's uh, the viability is maximized, uh, for example, at uh, 20, uh, uh, 20 degrees C. If we have a look uh, to the lagger strains, we can do the same conclusion. Uh, so you have two examples here, the S23 and the S189. Uh, uh, we can do the same conclusion about agitation. So simply with agitation, it's clearly uh, the best uh, condition. Uh, but for the temper uh, temperature, it's the opposite of what we, we just said before. And again, it's quite logical because we speak here about uh, lager strains, so uh, low fermentation uh, temperature is needed. So it's logic that we have um, a better viability at, for example, uh, 12 or 8 degrees than at uh, 32 degrees. Um, if we now have a look uh, on the impact of the radiation time on viability, or simply for how much time we have to radiate, uh, to answer this question, we have fixed some parameters. So we have in all the cases, a moderate, agita a moderate agitation and a temperature of medium at uh, 90 degrees Fahrenheit. 
and uh, you have on the left the example of three ale strain and on the right two example of uh, lager strains um, and so as as i said at the, at the beginning we have taken measurements after uh, 15 25 35 and 45 minutes of graduation and what we can tell is that for all the strain uh, tasted, uh, a, a good level of uh, viability is which uh, already after 15 minutes of reduation and reduate uh, more uh, doesn't seem to be to be needed. Um, if, I, if we can, if we take the example of T58. You, you already have uh, almost 95% of viability after 15 minutes, and it doesn't move after that. And it's the same for USO5 and S33. Uh, we only have a slight difference uh, for S23. You have a gap uh, between the two columns. But generally speaking, uh, we can say that uh, rehydration is complete after 15 minutes with uh, an excellent viability. Um, another parameter to try uh, it's uh, the medium uh, of rehydration. Uh, first, uh, if you want to do it with water, uh, here we have again fixed some parameters: uh, the moderate agitation and uh, the temperature is still at 90 uh, degrees Fahrenheit. And you have three examples: so T58, S23, and USO5, and three types of water: so distilled mineral and uh, tap water um, and what we can see is that viability is always the same uh, it doesn't matter uh, the type of water um, so we can clearly say that water quality uh, does not influence uh, the viability during uh, the rehydration of uh, active dry yeast and Last but not least, uh, if we if we want to play with uh, different type of wort, uh, what we can see. So again, uh, we have a moderate agitation uh, in all cases, and uh, we have tried uh, here uh, two temperature, so 68 uh, degree Fahrenheit on the left, and 45 degree Fahrenheit on the right. Um, what we can see is uh, we don't have significant difference. We have uh, a trend uh, where we see that uh, higher gravity world seems to be uh, better for viability. In each case, you see that the dark blue columns is higher than uh, the green uh, columns. So it's, uh, in dark blue, it's a higher uh, gravity world. It's quite su surprising, but we can explain that by, by the history of yeast, because at, at the beginning, uh, yeast have been selected directly in the world uh, of beer. So it's quite logic that they prefer higher gravity worlds. Uh, but it's just a trend, and it's not significant. So what we can say is uh, sugar concentration uh, does not significantly uh, influence viability during graduation. So many, many numbers, uh, and we will see the conclusion uh, at the end. But let's take the question by, by the other side and see how the direct pitching uh, can impact uh, yeast cell uh, vitality this time. Um, to study that, we have put in place uh, this protocol. Uh, so we have studied there uh, three different age strain and uh, three different lager strains. And each time uh, we have three uh, different radiation conditions. Uh, radiation in water at 30 degrees C with a moderate agitation. It will be uh, represented in the next slide by a W. Uh, radiation in uh, 15 uh, degree plateau wort at 30 degrees C with moderate agitation and it will be represented in the next slide by uh, 15 degree P. And no, no hydration at all, so direct pitch, and represent in next slide uh, by DP. 
So the same for Lager. Uh, we have the same standard wort at 15 degree P, a pitching rate of 50 gram per hectoliter for ale, uh, against uh, 100 gram per hectoliter for uh, Lager, and temperature of fermentation of 68 degree Fahrenheit for ale and 57 uh, degree Fahrenheit uh, for uh, Lager. Um, and to be sure that our results are consistent in time, uh, we are we have again done uh, an, an agit test to see that uh, if uh, the the results we see for direct pitch uh, are consistent with age active yeast. It's just a security check. Uh, to measure everything uh, all along with the fermentation, uh, we we have done tests in test performance in triplicate. Uh, so we evaluate by measuring the decrease of weight of the medium. And we evaluate the correlation to sugar con conversion into CO2 and ethanol. And on the other side, we have done analysis realized at the end of the fermentation by HPLC. Um, so HPLC simply means high performance liquid chromatography. So it's a technique to uh, quantify uh, different and differentiate uh, the different uh, compound in a in a mixture, and the compound uh, we want to identify and quantify is the ethanol, but also volatile compounds such as, such as acetaldehyde, esters, etc. Let's see uh, the results. So. Uh, First, uh, if we have a look uh, to ale strain uh, in general, I just show you here the example of uh, Safel USO5. Uh, about the different type of graph, you have there uh, the kinetic uh, of fermentation in ethanol produce and in days. Uh, at the bottom left, you have the apparent degree of fermentation. Um, on the top right, the total ethanol produced, and on top left, uh, bottom uh, bottom right, sorry, uh, the different volatile compounds uh, produce. And every time you you see the code, so DP direct patch, uh, direct pitching, W radiation in water, and 15 degree P radiation in uh, wort. Uh, first, if we look at uh, the kinetics, you see that uh, for the three type of radiation, we have exactly the same curves. Uh, same conclusion is down for the apparent degree of fermentation. The three columns are exactly the same. The same for ethanol production with a slight difference here, but pay attention to the scale, it's really small. And uh, for the different volatile compounds produced, uh, it's the same. We always have uh, the same uh, quantity. So it was an example of uh, ale strain. And as I said, we, we, just, uh, we just done this uh, security check to see if uh, these results are consistent in time. Uh, so on the left, you have the fresh active dry yeast and uh, on the right, uh, the age active dry yeast. And you see that uh, the curves uh, are always the same. So the result of uh, direct pitching uh, are the same between fresh active dry yeast and age active dry yeast after uh, four years. Um, if if we now take a look to uh, an example of Lager strain, so in this case it's uh, Saf Lager S23. Uh, you have the, the same type of graph, so I, I will not repeat myself, but uh, it's again the, the same conclusion. Uh, in all cases, uh, the type of radiation uh, doesn't have any impact on fermentation results. Yeah. As, as I said, it's, it's always the same, so I will not whip it again. And for the, uh, the aging test, we see that uh, the curves are consistent. We, are get, we arrived at the end of a level of ethanol around uh, seven. 
so uh, the results are consistent in time. So it's many, many number, many curves, many data, but what we can conclude of all of, uh, with all of that? So regarding the first part, what, what we can say is that for the agitation, more violent you are uh, for radiation, I'm speaking about radiation, more violent you are with your agitation, more you will uh, reduce the viability. Uh, the temperature doesn't seem to have a significant impact when no or moderate agi agitation. Uh, the type of media tested, so water or water, uh, had no significant influence on viability. Uh, for the time of radiation, we have seen that uh, the radiation is complete after uh, 15 minutes, and the results are consistent between ales and uh, lager strains. And for the second question, uh, we have seen, in fact, always the same uh, type of graph, uh, and on all these graphs, everything was always the same. So uh, we can say that direct pinching no, have no impact on fermentation kinetics, ethanol production or attenuation, and uh, volatile compound produce. So from these two study, what I can only recommend is just uh, take easy, take easy to use. Uh, easy to use, it's a, it's a utility brand we have created uh, to say that you can uh, pitch the yeast directly. Every time you will see uh, this logo on one of our products, you can pitch the yeast directly and we guarantee you that you will have uh, the same results in terms of kinetic, in terms of ethanol produce, in terms of volatile compound produce. Uh, it will be totally the same. After uh, we we know that many people uh, like to rehydrate and still want to rehydrate, um, so we just want to uh, let you the choice. Uh, so in, in fact, it, it, it depends on you what you prefer. But if you want to save time, uh, you can pitch directly, no problem. And finally, how all these results uh, I. I have presented you impact your your own brew because it, it's it's the most important at the end. Uh, simply as demonstrated, uh, the shelf life of our yeast is three years from production date. So pay attention to the best before and date on your sachet. Uh, store our yeast sachet in your fridge. Uh, you have a temperature below uh, 50 degrees Fahrenheit and it's protected from sunlight, so it's perfect. And just remember that you can keep your yeast sachet at room temperature for a short period of time, uh, below three months, if necessary. So don't worry uh, if you order your yeast uh, on the internet, for example. Uh, cool your water at the right, temper uh, right fermentation temperature, uh, generally speaking around 68 degrees Fahrenheit for air and 57 uh, degrees Fahrenheit for lager. Uh, transfer your water in the fermenter and don't ar don't ar aerate it. Uh, it's another question we we have many times, and uh, the answer comes from the slide of the yeast uh, uh, yeast reproduction I showed you at the beginning of the presentation. When we produce yeast, uh, we stop uh, the, uh, the reproduction cycle to uh, put the yeast in the best uh, condition to ferment right away as soon as uh, you will put it in your wort, meaning that uh, the yeast has all the energy uh, it's need. You don't need to aerate. You simply need to aerate when uh, you use harvested yeast or when you work in really extreme condition. Uh, after that, uh, simply open your yeast sachet uh, by using sanitized sizers. Uh, sprinkle the yeast directly on the top of your wort and close your fermenter and uh, let the magic uh, operate in the right uh, fermentation condition you all know. So finally, after this presentation, uh, I just hope that the only question you will have is uh, which train to choose. And it's totally dependent on you. Uh, we have uh, not uh, uh, a 
large amount of different uh, yeast strains. But our recommendation at, at Fermentis is that uh, yeast are polyvalent and uh, they can do many things. So uh, it's totally up to you to try and uh, to find what you like. So for the moment, we have 11 uh, strains uh, for the home segment, and we are always working uh, to develop more. Uh, but I can tell you that already with uh, 11 strains, you have a large amount of uh, possibilities to create different flavors, uh, different type of beer, and so on. Um, and if you still need uh, tips and advice, uh, what I can recommend you is simply visit uh, the tips and tricks section of our Fermentis website, uh, www.fermentis.com. Uh, you will find different brochures uh, to explain you, uh, mainly what I, I just explained you during this presentation, uh, but also some recommendation for beer types uh, and other tools. Uh, you can download everything, it's available on PDF. Uh, and you can also uh, download the Fermentis app. Uh, it's available on App Store and, and Android, and it's totally free. Uh, so don't hesitate to, to download it. You will find uh, different interesting article, uh, like this one about uh, Napa. You will find some fermentation tools uh, to help you to convert or to choose the right yeast or to compare, to compare our yeast. Um, and also some other cool stuff to, to find uh, where we will be, uh, where will be our next events. So it's quite complicated for the moment, but normally we do many events during the years. Uh, so yeah, just download it and um, try it yourself. Uh, so what I can say now is simply thank you for, for your attention. Uh, I know uh, it's, yeast is always a bit uh, complicated raw material uh, to understand if we're not uh, focused on it. Uh, but uh, thank you to, to listen to me and let's let's go for, for a Q&A. Uh, me and Jose are available if you want uh, to, if you have a question, we have 30 minutes to, to do that more or less. So let's do it. Brendan, are you with us? Can you hear me now? Here you go. Yeah, you are there. Well, perfect. Thank, thank you for an awesome presentation. Um, I, I think, I think we're going to ask some rich questions. So, uh, you did, you guys did a wonderful job giving an overview of the process on how you manufacture uh, your yeast. Um, and, and in my day job, I'm, I'm marveling. Uh, it's clear that you put quite a bit of attention and pride into your uh, quality processes uh, because your, your length of vitality and, and allowing for three years of shelf life is a testament to um, some of the quality quality procedures you've put into place. So that's that's great for us. Thank you. Um, I, I'd love to I, I'd love to open up the, the floor for questions from from the folks on the line. Uh, but I also want to give Hugo you a chance to uh, Talk about the Q and A session uh, that you've that you've uh, scheduled coming up as well. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you, Brendan. Uh, you are right. In fact, uh, on uh, Thursday, uh, we are organizing our first uh, Q and A session uh, with the current situation of COVID, and uh, we we can't travel anymore. So we want to to develop new interaction with uh, our brewers. And uh, we will try to put in place a monthly meeting from home brewers uh, to interact with us and ask all uh, the questions you could have uh, about uh, your brewing session, about yeast, about many things. So each month we will create uh, a meeting uh, of around 30 minutes just to take a bit together and discuss about brewing tips, brewing uh, 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 Yeast, uh, yeast topics related, uh, yeast related topics, and many things. So don't uh, hesitate to to join us on on Thursday, and we will complete the all the question you could have uh, after this uh, this presentation tonight. 
No, that's fantastic. Thank you, Hugo. And, I can. Um, oh, go ahead, Brendan. No, I'm I'm good. Thank you. I'm going to hand it off to the okay. question. I'm starting to see <laughs> come in. Perfect, uh, Hugo. If you want, I can take the the first one. Let's go. All right. So Sarah is asking, what test do you use uh, to confirm purity during the various QC steps? So we have a diversity of, of tests uh, kind of running from PCR, like real time PCR, but also plating. Uh, so I would say the big uh, one of the biggest tests you want to do is that actually what your lab is providing you in vials, you know, kind of the mother, for example, USO5 culture is the same that you're going to propagate uh, in the facility, you know, in the factory, which has like huge um, fermentation propagators or fermentation vessels. So it's pretty much the same. So uh, we run genetics through the process plating to check for contamination. Uh, but as Zugo mentioned at the beginning of his presentation, uh, when we produce the, the yeast and it's dry and kind of uh, packed in 500 grams or 11.5 uh, grams of sachets, we also run fermentations with them. So we, we see that the genetics match on the paper, that the plating comes back clean. But the last step, which each batch uh, we produce of every of our strains, like we run fermentations. Uh, so it's not big scale. Usually, you know, it's 100 ml or one liter. Uh, and we check that actually the profile in the, of the strain is in line with what we know from the strain, that we are reaching, you know, the upper attenuation the strain has to reach, that the fermentation kinetics are in line with what the strain should have. So it's a really tight process. And at the end of it, we do a positive quality release. So only when the strains clear all the tests, they are uh, available to be uh, sold to distributors and shipped around the world. Like if a batch doesn't clear one of the tests, uh, it gets destroyed. So you guys are using only the, the, the yeast that clear all the process and nothing goes into the market without being tested. Uh, so it's a very tight um, quality and quality specs as well. Do you want to take the other one, Hugo? Uh, I'm not sure to have the full answer for this one. So if you have, uh, mm -hmm. don't hesitate. It, okay. Uh, yeah. So the question is, how do you optimize re residual sulfide production from lager beer with dry yeast? Uh, so I would say, depend on your fermentation. Uh, oh, 10 ppm sulfide. Okay, that's quite specific. Uh, what are you? Uh, <laughs> what are you trying to make? I mean, 10. 10 ppm is the legal uh, maximum level that a uh, alcohol beverage can have of sulfate without being too uh, to label it as uh, it contains sulfate. So usually we see that uh, in wine, for example, that has more than 10 ppm sulfate. But today, uh, okay, uh, I would say like 10, 10 ppm of sulfate is uh, it's not a it's not a lot. Uh, so if you're getting more than that, if you have sent your beer for analysis. I guess uh, it's you have a lot of, of sulfites uh, in your beer. Uh, yeast produces sulfites because of many things. Uh, some strains, for example, uh, production sulfite production is a strain dependent. Uh, we know that very well in wine, but also we notice that that some beer strains have a tendency to produce a lot more sulfites than other ones. Uh, you can tweak sulfite production by nutrition. But I would say that between nutrition and uh, the strain genetics is like 20% nutrition, 80% strain uh, genetics. So I don't know if that answered your question, but uh, I would say that uh, it's more on the yeast you're using rather than like the nutrition or the fermentation itself. Yeah. Uh, to your comments, Brendan, I will just uh, answer quickly it's true that we have uh, a range of products as i said dedicated to the home segment so in small sachets of uh, 11.5 grams uh, so to brew between five uh, and eight gallons and uh, we have uh, a range of product for craft brewers um, so you have basically the same 
the same strains, uh, but we have few additions uh, in the crafts uh, segment, including the Safsauer LP652 you just mentioned. It's uh, a bacteria to produce uh, sour beer uh, through the kettle souring uh, method. Um, so we we are working to to develop uh, this this product in uh, in the home format, uh, but it always takes uh, time. Uh, but we are always thinking about it. And to answer uh, to your question about uh, Brettanomyces, uh, we are working on uh, many projects, uh, but it will come with with time. But we can't uh, develop more. Uh, about uh, all uh, the products we are working on uh, currently, but we are thinking about uh, Britannus Mises, of course, and about many other things. Stay tuned. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. It's uh, yeah. I'm going to take the other question. Uh, so well, uh, sorry, I'm saying Owen, but I don't know what uh, CT stand for. So. <laughs> Uh, but uh, yeah, the question is, how does uh, the HPLC data change with first pitch versus second, third pitch, and so on, uh, related to like volatiles? Uh, I would say that uh, there, there are some changes. Uh, I don't have data. Like most of us studies are run like through first generation. Uh, that being said, I don't have data uh, about uh, our strength, how they behave in multiple generations. What I do have, it's many experience like we customers uh, with different sizes, like, I don't know, let's talk about a, a brewery that eats maybe 5,000 barrels uh, per year up to big guys that are in the couple of hundred thousands. And those guys use uh, some of our strains many, many times, for example, USO5 up to like 12 generations in a fermentation vessel that can be 960 BBL. So we're talking about a lot of pressure, uh, kind of stress, stressing conditions for yeast. And if you're pushing the yeast 10, 12 generations, it's because uh, over time you are not seeing drift. You are not seeing mutation that has impact on the aromas. So uh, which will be, uh, which could, you know, uh, like the panel, the, the sensory panel of the brewery can detect it, or if you can be f uh, more fancy, you can set that for HPLC and get values on all the compounds you want to measure. Uh, and also in some other like easier parameters to follow, like kinetics of fermentation or attenuation. Uh, I do believe with time, and it's a fact actually that yeast, the, the yeast population changes. Uh, that's why at some point you drop, you know, that that yeast culture and you start with a fresh pitch because the beer, you know, it's not the same beer as you were brewing. Uh, but I think, you know, changes from generation one, two, and three are minimal. They, they, they will be, they will be for sure some variants, but it's minimal. So that's why you keep using the culture. Uh, but I don't have data like to, to, to show about that. Um, we have a question after for uh, reiteration for high gravity beers. Uh, above 35 uh, degree P. Um, so That's we, a big beer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you <monk. laughs> It's quite excessive, but uh, we, we don't have specific data for that. But, uh, but... For, for information, we have in our uh, craft range uh, a strain called uh, HA18, uh, HA for uh, high gravity beer. Uh, so, in fact, I would say that uh, I would direct pitch personally. I have never tried uh, such <laughs> uh, excessive beers. I don't know what you think, uh, Jose, if you have results in mind. But it's uh, yes, actually, was sorry to. I have a different opinion uh, than you. Um, I, I will definitely. Uh, like rehydrate uh, the yeast. We have studies up to 25 platos, and we Hugo show those slides. Up to 25 platos, like the yeast with that osmotic uh, stress uh, due to the amount of sugar there is in the wort, is uh, it's okay. We see no loss of viability. In your case, like talking over 35 platos, like definitely I will rehydrate the yeast. Uh, because, you know, uh, comparing some of our beer strain versus what we have in our distilling portfolio that today's 
those strains are used uh, to produce uh, neutral alkyl bases for hard cell cell production, production, but high gravity. Uh, that's a too high gravity uh, to direct peach the yeast uh, into. Yeah, I will. I would advise uh, rehydration, and even uh, if you see, you know. So I will advise rehydration. I will advise to peach maybe double or triple of what we recommend. So you have to check that the strains you are, the strain you are using can handle that potential alcohol production. Uh, and third, like if you uh, have a stock fermentation um, or end up with a sluggish fermentation in the next, you know, batch, I will try to get to that ABV uh, by adding the sugar, by doing a staggered sugar addition, you know, like a split, maybe 50-50 of the sugar additions and first addition at the beginning of fermentation, second addition at uh, 24 hour after the fermentation started. So that will allow to lower like the osmotic stress on the yeast dramatically. And also when you add the next batch, uh, let's say like over 30 platos, you want to target 40 platos, uh, you split like two batch of 20 platos. Uh, the yeast, the yeast, you know, that it's already in the 20 plato words will be uh, acclimate uh, to the alcohol content. So it can get like to a higher to a higher range and uh, fourth, but not least, I will also give some oxygenation to that yeast. Uh, we have data and proven that with our strains, you don't need oxygenation. That being said, of course, for everything, there is a limit and that limit is uh, in the ballpark of the 15, 20 platos. Like so extreme beers need uh, extreme attention and quite a few tweaks to get to it. Yeah. Thank you. And the next question is about the, the pitching rate um, and the impact of the pitching rate of like on like ester and phenol production. Um, I would say that it's uh, case by case, uh, but generally speaking, uh, if you over pitching, uh, you will increase uh, ester, ester production. And at the opposite, uh, if you under pitching, uh, you will favor uh, higher alcohol uh, production. But again, it's uh, generally speaking, it, it's more uh, a case, uh, case by case uh, topic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, like you was saying, we have uh, on our strain, so our earth season kind of farmhouse strain B134. We have a lot of data about how the strain behave with different pitch rate, different original gravities, different fermentation temperatures. Uh, also, we have an Abbey style strain called B256, and we have the same studies. We know very well how it behave at different pitch rate temperatures and original gravities. And it's it's uh, cool stuff, actually, because when you know how it works, then you, instead of like five batches to get to the profile you want, you just, you kind of narrow down that to like two batches. Uh, so we have that data, but it's uh, it's other presentations and pretty much, uh, I think we have a mashup presentation, Hugo, of B256, B134 and 3470. So that's... Uh, yeah, in, in fact, we try to, to characterize uh, deeply all our strains, uh, but it, take, it takes many, many times, many, many sensorial, uh, sensorial analysis. So in fact, we are, we are able to study what uh, two or three uh, strains deeply uh, per year. Uh, so it takes many time, but we are working on it. At B134, it's uh, one of, of the strain we, we have already done. Mm -hmm. uh, not sure that uh, we study <laughs> published on our website. Uh, we have a few articles uh, on our website, yeah. uh, so yeah. you can have a look, but I don't know about uh, the, mm. the studies. Yeah, to, to answer like Gregory and Owen question, uh, we, we don't put those studies. Uh, it's really nice data and that usually end up in publications. So we not we don't make it available on, on our website because we want to uh, walk you through the data. So we believe we're data driven but also we believe that data without sensory doesn't mean anything, you know? Uh, so the data that we, we create has many components and one big component is uh, gas chromatography and HPLC analysis of many volatiles. But at the same time, we look for correlations with what the 
ferment his strain sensory team is, is uh, you know, like uh, smelling, uh, perceiving in those beers to be, uh, I mean, to be accurate and characterize the strains and be like, okay, uh, I'm going to perceive, let's say, uh, more esters would be two, five, six, more like fruity esters when I under peach and I'm going to perceive would be two, five, six, uh, more uh, floral ester, sorry, when I under peach and more fruity ester when I just use the normal peach. So we kind of like want to walk you through through the studies um, because it, if if uh, it is uh, available out there, it kind of uh, there can be many interpretations. Uh, that being said, like me and Ugo, mainly Ugo, will be happy if you guys want to go through that. We can schedule other sessions like through the year and next year or two uh, to walk you through that. Um, in a non-pandemic year, we attend many trade shows like HomebrewCon, NanoCon, uh, and quite a few others where we are doing a lot of these presentations. Um, but not this year, so kind of the only way to see them is when, when we are doing a webinar, yeah. Yeah, but I think the question is quite interesting, and you did well to, to mention our uh, sensory analysis panel, because you are right, sometimes uh, the data says something, but the, sens the sensory panel is saying uh, a totally another thing. Uh, in France here, we have uh, this sensory panel, and every week, again, in normal time, not in pandemic, uh, but we are uh, testing uh, beers and we are putting comments on uh, on many things. So uh, it's important to to correlate these two information and to be able to ponderate a bit uh, the scientific data we could have uh, through uh, analysis like uh, HPLC. I'm just dropping on the chat a few like uh, scientific magazines for mm -hmm. the beer industry where we do have a we, where we like put papers uh we, we have quite a actually yeah we have a lot of things i mean even like regarding uh or sour peach or lactolactibacillus uh plantarum uh but yeah i mean it's uh, up to you guys uh, you can tell Ugo when you want to schedule the next session and we can we can keep talking about strains and and data so it's in your hands <laughs> So, uh, no, uh, uh, not, not for the moment. Uh, so actually all our Liger strains are uh, forever uh, gene strains. I guess that happened because, you know, like the industry is pretty much what they are, they are using. Uh, and in our case, before like releasing something new to the market, we look at different things, kind of uh, interest from the brewers. Uh, but also we look for uh, unique microorganisms, you know, something that is not, that we don't have in a portfolio. Uh, but I don't think anytime soon we will release a lager strain like from the Sazer group, yeah. Mm. What do you mean with a rated commercial Habe strain, uh, Brandon? If it comes from uh, Dorval or yeah. one of the, 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 the the breweries that uh, have uh, Abby's. Uh... Well, that's a good question. I don't know. Uh, there is. I always like to say there is one guy that knows that in fermentis, and like he does a very, very good job because when we have meetings, everybody buys him a beer, and he never disclosed everything, and he has been in that position for thirty years or more. So I think that's why they keep him here because even drunk, he will not concede anything. Uh, that being said, for example, some strains, uh, so how does it work? Like we look everywhere uh, in the world for strains, uh, you know, like, and uh, also sometimes we will disclose where the, the, the bank is, that strain is coming from. Yeah. And it, it is the case with uh, our Seth Lager strain, 3470. Uh, w3470, W stands for Wenstefan3470, and it's on our website. Uh, we source the strain directly from Wenstefan, and it's a strain, you know, that you can buy from us, but also you can buy in a liquid form uh, from Wenstefan. And also many liquid uh, yeast lab here in the United States, they changed the name for legal reasons, uh, but it's, it's uh, very, very similar. Uh, so uh, usually we don't disclose the brewery uh, 
the strain we're using uh, we're using come from yeah it's kind of company uh, policies i know that many other many other like yeast manufacturers disclose or even label the yeast with the name of the brewery but uh, but not not uh, not our case um yeah excellent i think we can take one or two more questions uh, i don't know what are you guys brewing right now like new england ipas are you making hard seltzer at home uh, sour beers or non-alcohol beer actually i'm having a non-alcohol beer like brewed with one of our our, our strains uh, really interesting microorganisms uh, maltes and maltotriose negative okay it seems to be good for tonight okay mixed fermentation showers yeah trendy side <laughs> <laughs> but yeah it's always interesting for us to know uh, what uh, people are doing because we can we have to adapt ourselves to the new trends so it's always good to to know what what you are currently doing guys mm -hmm. yeah yeah excellent well uh, just keep in mind that in the long run uh, we are trying to have all the the strain and fermentation solutions available for the craft uh, beer industry, also available for the home brewing industry. Uh, so we are not there quite yet, uh, but I hope that at some point all the craft, um, uh, all the strains we have for the craft beer industry will be will be available for you guys. Okay. Um... All right. So I think it's the time to, to thank you, everyone. Uh, thanks again, Brandon, uh, to have been in contact with me since, uh, I, I think since two or three months now. <laughs> we, 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 are, we are quite good in the organization. And uh, definitely we can do another session uh, next year uh, about another topic, uh, just discuss about it and, uh, and and I think what is uh, the best for you guys. Um, I just repeat that if you still have questions, uh, we have a Q&A on Thursday. It's totally up to you. Uh, you can, uh, I think, uh, Brandon have uh, communicated uh, on the event. Uh, so don't hesitate to jump in. It's only 30 minutes to, to share a beer and discuss about uh, brewing. And yeah, thanks again. And simply uh, see you next time. I hope. Maybe in person, if one day we can travel again. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Thank you again, Hugo and Joseph. Uh, wonderful presentation, extremely informative, and uh, we'll, we'll try to jump on your Q&A session coming up. So thank you again for supporting us. Perfect. Thank you very much, all guys. Oh, yeah. One thing uh, I have forgotten to mention is yeah. that um, with, uh, I will organize a, a waffle uh, with all the participants who were there tonight. Uh, I will do that uh, tomorrow morning because it's 2 a.m. for me here. Uh, and uh, I will send an email by putting uh, Brandon. Uh, I will put you in copy. And you you will have the opportunity to to win a special a special uh, fermentis gift. Uh, so you, the winner will have uh, the information tomorrow with uh, Brendan in copy. Yeah, very very cool uh, takeaway or uh, freebies. Yeah, <laughs> excellent. Well, take care, everyone. Stay safe. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Stay stay safe. Be well and uh, get some sleep. I know it's quite early in the morning for you guys. <laughs> no problem. Yeah, for Rugo is early. For me, it's not. I'm on the East Coast in the US, so it's not that late. <laughs> <laughs> See, you See you soon. See you soon. Bye bye. Right, take well. care, Rugo. Bye. See ya.